Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us on day two of the Access Industry Forum Knowledge Base um, keynote guest panel discussion. Today's discussion is the only discussion of the day, and it focuses on the claim culture. Um, arguably, you could say that the introduction of the Lost, Losted Review and following now his report, this stems fundamentally really from the development within the UK of a quite clear and obvious uh, culture now that um, you can claim and get financially rewarded for any type of accident you may have now involved at work. The intention of this discussion really is via the, um, the guest panelists that we have here today is to try and sort of spell out some of those, uh, the details behind that, those issues and actually lay out and either dispel or, or confirm some of those myths that may be out there in the, in the market at the moment. Um, just quickly running down the, uh, the lineup of guests here, I should say that we did, we did intend to have a representative from the Law Society here as well. Um, unfortunately, he's managed to get himself on the wrong train uh, this morning, so won't be, won't be able to make it. I did threaten to um, sue him for it, but he didn't see the funny side of that. But there's no um, fee. There's, <laughs> and I told him no win, no fee. Um, coming down the lineup, though, um, we have a uh, privilege here to have Jason Anker, who, as you may have seen earlier, was unfortunately a victim of a, uh, a fall from height and has been through the process of um, the compensation in terms of getting financial rewards. Uh, we have Peter Bond, who's chairman of the Edge Protection Federation, and we also have Philip Grace, representing the Association of British Insurers and also works for Aviva. So thank you very all much for coming this morning. Um, Jason, perhaps if I can start with you, um, could you maybe just quickly summarise from your perspective the, the compensation uh, scenario that happened with you, just sort of process how long it took, yeah, uh, that my, sort of thing. My case is very complex and it took 14 years from the day of my accident to get the full compensation. And uh, I think sometimes we focus on this claim to fame culture of all these little accidents. But what about the big people who have the serious accidents? You know, is it quite reliable? I think my case should have taken five. Five is average, five years. Just taken five yeah. years. Okay, thank you. Philip, coming to you, 14 years. Far too long. Far too long. I couldn't, the, I couldn't do anything but agree, it's far too long. Okay. There, I would say that there is arguably the case that the compensation culture um, has been manifested by the keenness by insurance, uh, insurance companies and also the law industry to actually see this as a sort of a commercial market grown exercise where they can jump on the back of um, someone's misfortune from to dramatise the situation, you're tripping over your shoelaces, you've got a good case for a claim um, and therefore you know, let's get some money out of, the, of your employer. Yeah, I, I think though, perhaps the main part of the compensation culture is not in the field of occupation. It's in the field of slips in the street, trips on pavements. I think most of the claims that I see in my daily work are real incidents where people have been seriously injured, often through the negligence of their employer. And that's what employer's liability insurance is set up to do, to determine whether there's been negligence and then deliver compensation. Unfortunately, in your position, Jason, that took too long. Peter, coming to you, you're, you're working on almost a day-to-day -day basis in terms of site activity um, and it, you know, any incidents and accidents that happen there in terms of claims and litigations. I mean, from your point of view as someone um, here, I suppose, in a role of the provider of that equipment, how have you seen, in, in your experience, sort of that fit into sort of the, this issue of I, accidents? And I think the problem, problem for the providers is that, in a way, we're the sitting ducks, and we can uh, we can't do anything entirely right because if there's an incident, then somebody is to blame, and even if the person concerned had caused the accident entirely themselves, there's still the issue of residual liability. So, as as either an employer or provider, you can still be uh, in a position where somebody is, uh, is pressurizing and threatening a claim, and it's a lot easier to actually pay them to go away. 
even though you haven't been at fault because uh, nearly all the equipment in the worker height industry is produced to uh, British and European uh, design standards. So it's really the equipment, it's usually a matter of the individuals and what they do. And then it comes back to a question of can you really prove as a, as a supplier that you have provided enough information and enough training to make sure that that accident didn't happen. Okay. Philip, do you want to come back on that in terms of insurance? How, how would that relate in terms of provider and, and that from an insurance perspective? Thinking about the claims that, that, that pass across my desk, there are a great number that result from some failure on the part of the person. They may not have been trained, they may not have picked the right piece of equipment. There are occasions where the equipment is at fault, there's some defect, but I think they're in the minority. Okay, okay. Um, moving on, Jason, I want to sort of come back to you. Knowing a little about your incident, you know, just if I, if I may quickly summarise, you, you fell 10 foot from a ladder uh, which you knew wasn't secured on. You knew, you knew that should have been secured, you chose not to do it. Um, I'm right in saying that, but then there was a, there was a number of people that were, were tempted yeah. to litigate to recover the cost from you. Can you sort of explain a bit more about that in terms of that, that process and who, and who was affected by that? Yeah, um, I was, obviously I was working for my father-in-law, so I sued him. He was working for a contractor, so we sued them as well. We sued the trustees of the charity. Uh, if you can imagine for 14 years, till my case was settled, all these people were directly affected by my claim. Because they had a hangover and at some stage they was going to be made liable. Okay. And, and how, did, how, how did they react in terms of, you know, because it, it sounds like it, they were going to everybody for the money they were trying Yeah, to um, there was a lot of problem with the insurance itself. Uh, my father-in-law, 1992 had been the last big recession. He was trying to cut back on a few things. First thing he cut back on, he had no liability insurance. Uh, the school was building, they got no liability insurance as well. So you can understand my claim was slightly complex, <laughs> to say the least. And, and that had a lot to do with it taking 14 yeah, years in terms it. of... Right, OK, OK. Um, what Lo Lofsted talks about is the, the burden on health and safety and, you know, in the middle of a recession as we are now, that it's preventing uh, the development of business and getting the, the economy back on track. And I suspect a lot of that is because um, businesses really aren't sure what they've got to do to avoid being open to, I guess, you know, being financially penalised for maybe an incident or accident that maybe one of their operatives or one of their um, subcontractors operatives have been done. Um, Philip, coming back to you, from, from an insurance point of view, what, what is there from the insurance industry that can help advise people? Because I suspect um, you know, as we've heard in, in previous discussions over the, the days so far, that the way the regulations are wrote, it's very much down to your own interpretation. And the fact that it's down to your own interpretation could mean that you're interpreting it from this end of the scale, from this end of the scale, and arguably companies could be then thinking, maybe I'd better look at the whole scale to cover myself, which may still not be effective either. I, I think the best way of looking at this is, the first requirement is to satisfy the law. If you can satisfy the HSE inspector that you've interpreted the legislation and you have a safe system of working, then that's good enough for us. If there's an accident, the allegation from the claimant, from the injured employer, will be that you were negligent. As an employer, you didn't do what you should have done. And what we would look for as your insurer is evidence that you had looked at the law and decided how you were going to meet the requirements of the law then it's a case of proving it, which might well mean rec written risk assessments, records of training, records of refresher training and so on. Because it all comes down to proof in the end. And if you haven't got that proof, it may well be your word as employer against that of the employee who's been injured. That's interesting. Okay, Peter, from your point of view, from a training perspective, do you sort of echo what Philip says there in terms of oh, this, the underlying this, point? This question of Proof and evidence uh, runs right the way through everything that we, we do as an industry uh, and, the, and our own customers 
Uh, there is a paper trail there. And I think part of the, the other problem that we had that Philip just mentioned is this is one of interpretation because the, the forerunner of the work at Heitreg, for instance, uh, had a very prescriptive, very detailed and specific requirement in lots of places. They had deliberately removed a lot of that very specific detail. Even things like platform widths and towboard heights have been taken out. So you, you have an area where you've generated uh, uncertainty and interpretation, which is where the lawyers can come in and make their own interpretation. And all you can do as an industry is to try and make sure that you, you have those records wherever possible, you have the toolbox talks as often as you can, and you try and make sure you tabulate all the content uh, and cover it as, as well as you possibly can. But in, in a practical way, some of those actions aren't always feasible to record in the way that you want. Right. Because is there ever enough evidence if there's been a serious accident? Yeah. I mean, taking on board what you're saying, I mean, even if you have all the, the training in place in terms of the equipment and the personnel, hmm. Jason, I mean, moving on to you, you, you knew what you should have done right. Yeah. Yep. And, and you chose not, not to, to do it. Yeah. That's right. I mean, so being sort of on devil's advocate here, you could say it was all your fault. It was, yeah. And then you could say, why should they be going after the company you work for? Why should they be going after the school you're on? Yeah. Um, the time of my accident when I was in hospital, I didn't actually think I even had a claim. It was only when the sister came to me and I got some guidance that actually someone was at fault and someone was to blame for my injuries. Um, Fundamentally, I was blaming myself anyway. Um, but the process I went through was not a particularly enjoyable process from the start where it was managed, what happened to me, and 14 years is, you know, says itself, a long time. Philip, coming back to you then. So, taking a, a scenario such as Jason's, he knew what the right things were to do. He chose not to do it on, the, on that particular moment. He had an accident. But still, I'm right in saying the process would be that they would, that claimant would still look and potentially be successful in getting a claim. Everybody has the right to claim. Um, the, the, the aftermath, the process of handling that claim, part of that will involve deciding what happened and why it happened. And that might end up with a decision that the individual was partly to blame. And if that's the case, their damages will be reduced. It's called contributory negligence. Um, generally speaking, <laughs> it is a generalisation. You never find, in my experience, the employer did not have some role, did not fail in some way. Insufficient training, uh, not, not providing enough guidance, perhaps not providing quite the right ladder. Generally speaking, um, the employer has to accept, we find, some element of blame. But the individual, if they have ignored their training, ignored the safety rules, used the wrong piece of equipment, may end up losing a third or even a half, generally not more than that, of their compensation. Okay. Just sticking with you for a moment, taking on board that compensation. So uh, an accident's happened, it's been determined that there's a claim. Can you talk through then the process in the absence of our colleague from the Law Society, the sort of process in terms of how and where and why would that or would that not get to court and how, how in a way are those damages calculated? Right. Uh, Big question, I, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> assume for the sake of argument that the injured person has a solicitor, uh, he will write to the employer and raise a claim. Uh, the employer duty bound to send that letter immediately to his EL insurer and from then on the insurer has the complete control of that claim. Um, it's, in the, it's in the policy, you have to do that. Um, there will then begin a process of negotiation. Um, the claimant solicitor will make allegations that there was insufficient training, the wrong ladder, there should have been a tower scaffold, there were no tow boards or whatever and the insurer 
or their solicitor, because we may well appoint a solicitor to manage the claim, will seek to rebut, to, to refute those allegations. They will ask the employer for training records, they will take photographs of equipment of the place where the accident occurred, they may take witness statements and so forth. And they will then begin a, a process of negotiation with the claimant's solicitor. In about 90% of cases, that negotiation will go to conclusion. There will be an agreement that there was an accident, that the employer was to blame, that the he was one third to blame, and there will be some calculation of damages. I'll come back to that in a moment. If that agreement cannot be reached, then we may end up in court. But I would stress that it's 10% at most of claims that go to court. So it's a very small percentage of claims that get to be heard in front of a judge. The calculation of damages is quite complicated, but essentially it's all around loss of earnings. And for someone, unfortunately like Jason, who will not be able to return to work, it's a calculation designed to put him back in the position he would have been before the accident, to cover for the lost wages that he would have earned because of this accident, he's not going to earn them. There are all sorts of other calculations and other amounts, payment for wheelchairs or artificial limbs, payment for loss of the ability to do things like maintenance of the house or the garden. We may pay for, or the claim may cover the cost of an adapted car. So it's quite a complicated process, and our claims people have fairly rigorous procedures to calculate just what the claim will be worth. Okay. Jason, coming on to you then, does that, does that sound familiar? Is that what happened to you? That's exactly how it was, yeah. And in, and in terms of the figure, the figure that they came to, was that just the figure that you got, or what happened? No, I got, the figure they came up with exactly what you said. They made, uh, made me an offer on the fact that I was contributing negligent to the accident. Um, I just feel sometimes that these small trips and falls may be worth sort of two and a half thousand, five thousand pounds, are probably paid up in full because it's easier to pay them small fines to go to court and yet more serious accidents where the victim has yeah maybe slight involvement quite a large chunk of his compensation can be taken away in the negotiating stages you know the guy who's actually claiming for a sprain and will get his full amount he claims for and yet the guy who's got a legitimate claim maybe can learn 30 40 50 percent of his claim yeah philip you want to come back on that um, I, I can't but agree with Jason. There is a, a, a seeming inequality. Um, we do get slips and trips in the workplace, um, but by far the biggest volume of slips and trips are what I would call public liability claims. They're not dealt with under the EL policy. They're people tripping outside shops or slipping at the fresh fruit counter because some grapes have fallen on the floor. They're very low value claims. You're absolutely right, Jason, a few thousand pounds. Um, it costs us quite a lot of money to settle those claims. Believe it or not, it can cost 80 or 90% of the compensation just to deliver those four or five thousand pounds. I would say, I have to admit, the system looks broken when you look at that disparity. And there is a big difficulty um, in arguing that a shopper with a trolley and a child should have seen the great and not trodden on it. But that's the parallel we have. And it is, um, I can't but agree, it does seem inequitable, but it is the way the system works at the moment. And I'm, I have to say, I'm not sure I see a solution. That's why I said everybody's interest as a victim to claim. Because the chances are, they Maybe don't, the, the person that you're claiming from won't want the bother. They definitely won't want to go to court because the judge is probably likely to be sympathetic to the victim. So it's much easier to settle it. And that, in a way, is stoking this whole claims culture because there's every reason why, for minor incidents, you should make a claim because they're likely to settle it. You have nothing to lose. Yeah. But wh why, why are we in this situation? Because, I mean, you know, I, I've been working in this industry for... God knows how long. And, um, you know, when I first started this industry, there was not this culture of if you tripped over a paving slab on the floor or something, you fell and you thought, 
I, I need to claim on this. You picked yourself up and thought, you, Wally, what did you fall over that thing for? It's right in front of you. And you carried on. But we now have a whole industry which, you know, you hear, you hear about um, insurance companies and law in, in businesses working in cahoots and sharing each other's data and uh, hospitals passing on information where incidents have come in, where someone has such a small claim. And it's now become its own industry in itself. And, and you know, you know, you've got the government saying that the reason that the, the, bus the economy can't get back on track is because health and safety is a monster and a burden to business. But it seems that it's the insurance companies and the law, law companies who are still doing very well out of it. Um, I'm not sure we're doing very well out of it, but uh, I think generally you're right. I, I think it's perhaps part of a, a wider change in society. Certainly, I don't think people at work really are influenced or motivated by daytime television adverts. I do have a view that if you've been made redundant, uh, your firm has been wound up, you're sitting at home watching daytime television and every third or fourth advert is for a personal injury lawyer, you are tempted. And as Peter says, you really have nothing to lose. But I think that is, for work accidents, that is the exception. But for people who trip over in the shopping mall, or slip on the station on a wet platform, yeah, there is nothing to lose. Quite right. I mean, it, part of our, our problem as an industry and for all those claims is that really the lawyers have become much more proactive, yeah. aggressive, greedy, and that's in a way what's changed. There were incidents before and we accepted our own level of responsibility or accepted the fact that it was it was an act of God or something. But the assumption these days is that somebody else is always to blame and there's always a lawyer advertising, texting you all the time to actually encourage you to submit a claim on that yeah. same basis. Yeah. Why not? So I, the, the only way I could actually see any of this reducing is if there were constraints on the lawyers uh, and limitations on how far you can actually push people to submit a claim. I have no idea if that could happen, but that's got to be restrained. And those, so th th those text messages that say, we know about your claim, there's three and a half thousand pounds in it for you, ring us today, that ought to be illegal. Okay. We have to bear in mind that one of the there were two things that, that, that I think we have to take into account. There was a point, and I can't remember which year, but prior to that, solicitors were not allowed to advertise. So they couldn't have adverts on the bus shelter outside the A&E department. The other thing was that in order to save money, some years ago, the government abolished legal aid. So that generated a legal business. And those sort of factors have to be taken into account. Maybe Peter's right some change in those sort of areas would have as much if not more impact than anything we might be able to do. Yeah, it, it's funny actually because effectively what you're talking about is the communication of, of this sort of offering and, and almost without doubt in every single discussion we've had so far communication is, is fundamental to every single issue we've talked about regardless of what we're talking about in terms of working at height. Um, we're, we're drawing to the end of the half hour that we have here allocated for this session. Um, just quickly, we, we are able to take one or two questions from the audience, if anyone has a question. If just bear with us while we get your microphone, sir, and if you could just say your name and your company as well, that'd be great. Uh, yes, my name is uh, Martin Bastone, and I'm here representing the Heritage Safety Group. Um, I attended the Westminster Legal Forum uh, earlier on in the year at which Professor Lofsted spoke. Um, there were representatives from across the board, including insurance companies and representing the uh, claims um, business as well. Now, the chap from the claims business uh, said categorically, there is no claims culture, it is a myth. Um, now, this was challenged by a member of the audience who represents um, organizations, uh, shops, etc. Um, and it was ignored. However, um, a colleague of mine has spoken with Chris Grayling, um, 
and Chris Groening has stated that he would be very interested in hearing um, from people who um, actually, well, effectively know better. Um, it, there needs to be a counter-argument because the Lofsted report had a very limited remit. It didn't look at public claims at all, apart from whiplash industries, in, um, injuries. Um, so I really think that this is something you need to challenge because otherwise this is just going to carry on. And you're quite right, just before I came into the meeting, I received a text from a company telling me they need, they need me to contact them urgently because um, they need to talk, me, talk to me about the claim um, that I had. Yeah. Injury plan. Yeah. Really, isn't it? It's a lie. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank yeah. you. Any other questions at all? Yes, sir. Right, sit. Hello, uh, it's Ian Hutchings from Vita Safety. It's a, a question for Philip, really. Um, do you think insurers should penalise small businesses more through their um, insurance policy for not having robust health and safety controls? Uh, a good question. At this point, I generally remind people that employers' liability insurance is not designed to enforce or enhance or persuade people to manage risk. It's actually to deliver compensation to the likes of Jason. It's a competitive business, and if my em employer, Aviva, were to uh, demand really, really high standards of health and safety, or to increase premiums if they weren't there, people would walk. They'd go to other insurers who were not so demanding. Um, so it's a very difficult balance. But the primary aim of EL insurance is to deliver compensation, not improve health and safety, strange as it may seem. Perhaps, perhaps maybe what's actually needed is for organisations maybe such as those within the AF and that sort of thing to sit down with the likes of ABI and the Law Society, etc., and almost lay out from a, from a work in a height, it's what we're talking about here, a sort of scenario of the type of things that a, a company should have in place as a checklist for their employers and equipment that they use, and also that the, there's some sort of communication, communication the C word, into the business to ensure that then those operatives actually understand what they should be expecting as well. Um, the reason I smile is because the chief executives of the main insurers went to number 10 in February. And one of the outputs from that is we've agreed as an industry to put an insert into the policy document. Um, the Department of Work and Pensions has organized focus groups and we have a list of subjects that are causing small businesses concerns. Um, we're going to put it in the policy document. Uh, we hope that the insurance brokers will pass it on to uh, the policy holders. Um, I'm really interested in the subjects that cause people problems. It's um, PAT testing, it's loan working, it's student placements. They don't give me any problems, they don't generally cause many claims. There was a reference to step ladders and work at height, but it's a start, but the reality is I'm going to be allowed, or the industry is going to be allowed, two sides of A4, and it's not enough. We just okay. cannot get across what we expect from people on a couple of sides of A4 okay. paper. But gentlemen, we have to wind it up there. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I think um, what we plan to do here, you've seen this discussion is filmed, as are all our discussions. This will go up on the AIF website. And we will also have a facility on the website to comment further, allow you to comment further based on this discussion. And if need be, we can feed it to panelists for them to respond to. So although we've run out of time here, it can carry on online. Um, I think there's a long way to go on this. Hopefully this has spelled out some of the detail behind it. Maybe there's opportunities here that we can take forward to help try and um, advise industries on what they should be doing but clearly it sounds like there needs to be certain there needs to be an audit trail in terms of what a company has done and from the individuals involved they need to know clearly what they should be able to do before they get up and work from height. Thank you very much for your time. We're out of time. I apologize um, but thank you all for coming. Hope it was interesting and thank you very much to our guests. Thank you. Was the question that you asked answered successfully? Uh, yes, it was. Yeah, yeah, and the, the, the question that you asked in particular, were you looking for a particular answer? Uh, to, to a degree, I think. I think one of the problems is 
I, I run a health and safety consultancy and a lot of small smaller businesses we deal with are very unlikely to put in spend the money on health and safety controls unless somebody is almost forcing them to. Um, you know, with the with the reduction in HSC resources, I'm looking at maybe the insurers perhaps to be a bit more sort of punitive in that area.